Chapter 9 of Around the World in Eighty Days. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne. Translated by George Makepeace Towell. Chapter 9 In Which the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean Prove Propitious to the Designs of Phileas Fogg. The distance between Suez and Aden is precisely thirteen hundred and ten miles, and the regulations of the company allow the steamers one hundred and thirty-eight hours in which to traverse it. The Mongolia, thanks to the vigorous exertions of the engineer, seemed likely, so rapid was her speed, to reach her destination considerably within that time. The greater part of the passengers from Brindisi were bound for India, some for Bombay, others for Calcutta, by way of Bombay, the nearest route thither now that a railway crosses the Indian peninsula. Among the passengers was a number of officials and military officers of various grades, the latter being either attached to the regular British forces or commanding the Sepoy troops and receiving high salaries ever since the central government has assumed the powers of the East India Company, for the sub-lieutenants get 280 pounds, brigadiers 2,400 pounds, and generals of divisions 4,000 pounds. What with the military men, a number of rich young Englishmen on their travels, and the hospitable efforts of the purser, the time passed quickly on the Mongolia. The best of fare was spread upon the cabin tables at breakfast, lunch, dinner, and the eight o'clock supper, and the ladies scrupulously changed their toilets twice a day, and the hours were whirled away when the sea was tranquil with music, dancing, and games. But the Red Sea is full of caprice, and often boisterous like most long and narrow gulfs. When the wind came from the African or Asian coast, the Mongolia with her long hull rolled fearfully, then the ladies speedily disappeared below. The pianos were silent. Singing and dancing suddenly ceased. Yet the good ship ploughed straight on, unretarded by wind or wave, towards the straits of Babel Mandeb. What was Phileas Fogg doing all this time? It might be thought that, in his anxiety, he would be constantly watching the changes of the wind, the disorderly raging of the billows every chance, in short, which might force the Mongolia to slacken her speed, and thus interrupt his journey. But if he thought of these possibilities, he did not betray the fact by any outward sign. Always the same impassable member of the Reform Club, whom no incident could surprise, as unvarying as the ship's chronometers, and seldom having the curiosity even to go up on the deck, he passed through the memorable scenes of the Red Sea with cold indifference, did not care to recognize the historic towns and villages which, along its borders, raised their picturesque outlines against the sky, and betrayed no fear of the dangers of the Arabic Gulf, which the old historians always spoke of with horror, and upon which the ancient navigators never ventured without propitiating the gods by ample sacrifices. How did this eccentric personage pass his time on the Mongolia? He made his four hearty meals every day, regardless of the most persistent rolling and pitching on the part of the steamer, and he played whist indefatigably, for he had found partners as enthusiastic in the game as himself. A tax collector on the way to his post at Goa, the Reverend Decimus Smith returning to his parish at Bombay, and a brigadier-general of the English army who was about to rejoin his brigade at Benares, made up the party and with Mr. Fogg played whist by the hour, together in absorbing silence. As for Passepartout, he too had escaped seasickness, and took his meals conscientiously in the forward cabin. He rather enjoyed the voyage, for he was well fed and well lodged, took a great interest in the scenes through which they were passing, and consoled himself with the delusion that his master's whim would end at Bombay. He was pleased on the day after leaving Suez to find on deck the obliging person with whom he had walked and chatted on the quays. "'If I am not mistaken,' said he, approaching this person, with his most amiable smile, "'you are the gentleman who so kindly volunteered to guide me at Suez. Ah, I quite recognize you. You are the servant of the strange Englishman. Just so, Monsieur Fix.' "'Monsieur Fix,' resumed Passepartout, I'm charmed to find you on board. Where are you bound? Like you, to Bombay? That's capital. Have you made this trip before? 
Several times I am one of the agents of the Peninsular Company. Then you know India. Why, yes, replied Fix, who spoke cautiously. A curious place, this India. Oh, very curious. Mosques, minarets, temples, fakers, pagodas, tigers, snakes, and elephants. I hope you will have ample time to see the sights. I hope so, Monsieur Fix. You see, a man of sound sense ought not to spend his life jumping from a steamer upon a railway train and from a railway train upon a steamer again, pretending to make the tour of the world in eighty days. No, all these gymnastics, you may be sure, will cease at Bombay. And Mr. Fogg is getting on well, asked Fix in the most natural tone in the world. Quite well, and I too. I eat like a famished ogre. It's the sea air. But I never see your master on deck. Never. He hasn't the least curiosity. Do you know, Mr. Passepartout, that this pretended tour in eighty days may conceal some secret errand? Perhaps a diplomatic mission? Faith, Monsieur Fix, I assure you I know nothing about it, nor would I give half a crown to find out. After this meeting, Passepartout and Fix got into the habit of chatting together, the latter making it a point to gain the worthy man's confidence. He frequently offered him a glass of whiskey or pale ale in the steamer barroom, which Passepartout never failed to accept with graceful alacrity, mentally pronouncing Fix the best of good fellows. Meanwhile the Mongolia was pushing forward rapidly. On the thirteenth, Mocha, surrounded by its ruined walls, whereon date trees were growing, was sighted, and on the mountains beyond were espied vast coffee fields. Passepartout was ravished to behold this celebrated place, and thought that with its circular walls and dismantled fort it looked like an immense coffee cup and saucer. The following night they passed through the strait of Babel Mandab, which means in Arabic the Bridge of Tears and the next day they put in at Steamer Point, northwest of Aden Harbor, to take in coal. This matter of fueling steamers is a serious one at such distances from the coal mines. It costs the Peninsular Company some 800,000 pounds a year. In these distant seas, coal is worth three or four pounds sterling a ton. The Mongolia had still 1,650 miles to traverse before reaching Bombay, and was obliged to remain four hours at Steamer Point to coal up. But this delay, as it was foreseen, did not affect Phileas Fogg's program. Besides, the Mongolia, instead of reaching Aden on the morning of the 15th, when she was due, arrived there on the evening of the 14th, a gain of 15 hours. Mr. Fogg and his servant went ashore at Aden to have the passport again visaed. Fix, unobserved, followed them. The visa procured, Mr. Fogg returned on board to resume his former habits, while Passepartout, according to custom, sauntered about among the mixed population of Somalis, Banyans, Parsis, Jews, Arabs, and Europeans who comprised the 25,000 inhabitants of Aden. He gazed with wonder upon the fortifications which make this place the Gibraltar of the Indian Ocean, and the vast cisterns where the English engineers were still at work, two thousand years after the engineers of Solomon. "'Very curious, very curious,' said Passepartout to himself on returning to the steamer. "'I see that it is by no means useless to travel if a man wants to see something new.' At 6 p.m. the Mongolia slowly moved out of the roadstead and was soon once more on the Indian Ocean. She had a hundred and sixty-eight hours in which to reach Bombay, and the sea was favorable, the wind being in the northwest, and all sails aiding the engine. The steamer rolled but little. The ladies in fresh toilets reappeared on deck, and the singing and dancing were resumed. The trip was being accomplished most successfully, and Passepartout was enchanted with the congenial companion which chance had secured him in the person of the delightful Fix. On Sunday, October 20th, towards noon, they came in sight of the Indian coast. Two hours later the pilot came on board. A range of hills lay against the sky in the horizon, and soon the rows of palms which adorned Bombay came distinctly into view. The steamer entered the road formed by the islands in the bay, and at half-past four she hauled up at the quays of Bombay. Phileas Fogg was in the act of finishing the thirty-third rubber of the voyage, 
and his partner and himself having by a bold stroke captured all thirteen of the tricks concluded this fine campaign with a brilliant victory the mongolia was due at bombay on the twenty-second she arrived on the twentieth this was a gain to phileas fogg of two days since his departure from london and he calmly entered the fact in the itinerary in the column of gains End of chapter 9Chapter 10 of Around the World in 80 Days. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne. Translated by George Makepeace Towell. Chapter 10 In Which Passepartout is Only Too Glad to Get Off with the Loss of His Shoes. Everybody knows that the great reverse triangle of land with its base in the north and its apex in the south, which is called India, embraces 1,400,000 square miles, upon which is spread unequally a population of 180 millions of souls. The British crown exercises a real and despotic dominion over the larger portion of this vast country and has a governor-general stationed at Calcutta, governors at Madras. Bombay, and in Bengal, and a lieutenant-governor at Agra. But British India, properly so called, only embraces 700,000 square miles, and a population of from 100 to 110 millions of inhabitants. A considerable portion of India is still free from British authority, and there are certain ferocious rajas in the interior who are absolutely independent. The celebrated East India Company was all-powerful from 1756, when the English first gained a foothold on the spot where now stands the city of Madras, down to the time of the great Sepoy insurrection. It gradually annexed province after province, purchasing them of the native chiefs, whom it seldom paid, and appointed the governor-general and his subordinates, civil and military. But the East India Company has now passed away, leaving the British possessions in India directly under the control of the crown. The aspect of the country, as well as the manners and distinctions of race, is daily changing. Formerly one was obliged to travel in India by the old cumbrous methods of going on foot or on horseback, in palacans or unwieldy coaches. Now fast steamboats ply on the Indus and the Ganges, at a great railway, with branch lines joining the main line at many points on its route, traverses the peninsula from Bombay to Calcutta in three days. This railway does not run in a direct line across India. The distance between Bombay and Calcutta, as the bird flies, is only from 1,000 to 1,100 miles, but the deflections of the road increase this distance by more than a third. The general route of the Great Indian Peninsula Railway is as follows. Leaving Bombay, it passes through Salsetta, crossing to the continent opposite Tanna, goes over the chain of the western Ghats, runs thence northeast as far as Burmhampur, skirts the nearly independent territory of Bundelkhand, ascends to Allahabad, turns thence eastwardly, meeting the Ganges at Benares, then departs from the river a little, and descending southeastward by Berdivian, and the French town of Chandernagor has its terminus at Calcutta. The passengers of the Mongolia went ashore at half-past four p.m. At exactly eight, the train would start for Calcutta. Mr. Fogg, after bidding good-bye to his whist partners, left the steamer, gave his servant several errands to do, urged it upon him to be at the station promptly at eight, and with his regular step which beat to the second like an astronomical clock directed his steps to the passport office as for the wonders of bombay its famous city hall its splendid library its forts and docks its bazaars mosques synagogues its armenian churches and the noble pagoda on malabar hill with its two polygonal towers he cared not a straw to see them he would not deign to examine even the masterpieces of Elephanta, or the mysterious Hypogea, concealed southeast from the docks, or those fine remains of Buddhist architecture, the Canharian grottoes of the island of Salsetta. Having transacted his business at the passport office, Phileas Fogg repaired quietly to the railway station, where he ordered dinner. 
Among the dishes served up to him, the landlord especially recommended a certain giblet of native rabbit on which he prided himself. Mr. Fogg accordingly tasted the dish, but despite its spice sauce found it far from palatable. He rang for the landlord, and on his appearance said, fixing his clear eyes upon him, "'Is this rabbit, sir?' "'Yes, my lord,' the rogue boldly replied. "'Rabbit from the jungles.' "'And this rabbit did not mew when he was killed?' "'Mew, my lord? What a rabbit, mew! I swear to you. Be so good, landlord, as not to swear. But remember this. Cats were formerly considered in India as sacred animals. That was a good time. For the cats, my lord? Perhaps for the travellers as well.' after which Mr. Fogg quietly continued his dinner. Fix had gone on shore shortly after Mr. Fogg, and his first destination was the headquarters of the Bombay police. He made himself known as a London detective, told his business at Bombay, and the position of affairs relative to the supposed robber, and nervously asked if a warrant had arrived from London. It had not reached the office. Indeed, there had not yet been time for it to arrive. Fix was sorely disappointed, and tried to obtain an order of arrest from the director of the Bombay police. This the director refused, as the matter concerned the London office, which alone could legally deliver the warrant. Fix did not insist, and was fain to resign himself to await the arrival of the important document. But he was determined not to lose sight of the mysterious rogue as long as he stayed in Bombay. He did not doubt for a moment, any more than Passepartout, that Phileas Fogg would remain there, at least until it was time for the warrant to arrive. Passepartout, however, had no sooner heard his master's orders on leaving the Mongolia than he saw at once that they were to leave Bombay as they had done Suez and Paris, and that the journey would be extended at least as far as Calcutta, and perhaps beyond that place. He began to ask himself if this bet that Mr. Fogg talked about was not really in good earnest, and whether his fate was not in truth forcing him, despite his love of repose, around the world in eighty days. Having purchased the usual quota of shirts and shoes, he took a leisurely promenade about the streets, where crowds of people of many nationalities, Europeans, Persians with pointed caps, banyas with round turbans, Sindhis with square bonnets, Parsis with black mitres, and long-robed Armenians were collected. It happened to be the day of a Parsi festival. These descendants of the sect of Zoroaster, the most thrifty, civilized, intelligent, and austere of the East Indians, among whom are counted the richest native merchants of Bombay, were celebrating a sort of religious carnival, with processions and shows, in the midst of which Indian dancing girls, clothed in rose-colored gauze, looped up with gold and silver, danced airily, but with perfect modesty, to the sound of viols and the clanging of tambourines. It is needless to say that Passepartout watched these curious ceremonies with staring eyes and gaping mouth, and that his countenance was that of the greenest booby imaginable. Unhappily for his master, as well as himself, his curiosity drew him unconsciously farther off than he intended to go. At last, having seen the Parsi carnival wind away in the distance, he was turning his steps towards the station when he happened to espy the splendid pagoda on Malabar Hill, and was seized with an irresistible desire to see its interior. He was quite ignorant that it is forbidden to Christians to enter certain Indian temples, and that even the faithful must not go in without first leaving their shoes outside the door. It may be said here that the wise policy of the British government severely punishes a disregard of the practices of the native religions. Passepartout, however, thinking no harm, went in like a simple tourist, and was soon lost in admiration of the splendid Brahmin ornamentation which everywhere met his eyes, when of a sudden he found himself sprawling on the sacred flagging. He looked up to behold three enraged priests, who forthwith fell upon him, tore off his shoes, and began to beat him with loud savage exclamations. The agile Frenchman was soon upon his feet again, and lost no time in knocking down two of his long-gowned adversaries with his fists, and a vigorous application of his toes, 
Then, rushing out of the pagoda as fast as his legs could carry him, he soon escaped the third priest by mingling with the crowd in the streets. At five minutes before eight, Passepartout, hatless, shoeless, and having in the squabble lost his package of shirts and shoes, rushed breathlessly into the station. Fix, who had followed Mr. Fogg to the station and saw that he was really going to leave Bombay, was there upon the platform. He had resolved to follow the supposed robber to Calcutta, and farther if necessary. Passepartout did not observe the detective, who stood in an obscure corner, but Fix heard him relate his adventures in a few words to Mr. Fogg. "'I hope that this will not happen again,' said Phileas Fogg coldly, as he got into the train. Poor Passepartout, quite crestfallen, followed his master without a word. Fix was on the point of entering another carriage, when an idea struck him which induced him to alter his plan. "'No, I'll stay,' he muttered he. "'An offence has been committed on Indian soil. I've got my man.' Just then the locomotive gave a sharp screech, and the train passed out into the darkness of the night. End of chapter 10「Eleven of Around the World in Eighty Days. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne. Translated by George Makepeace Towel. Chapter Eleven, in which Phileas Fogg secures a curious means of conveyance at a fabulous price. The train had started punctually. Among the passengers were a number of officers, government officials, and opium and indigo merchants whose business called them to the eastern coast. Passepartout rode in the same carriage with his master, and a third passenger occupied a seat opposite to them. This was Sir Francis Cromarty, one of Mr. Fogg's whist partners on the Mongolia, now on his way to join his corps at Benares. Sir Francis was a tall, fair man of fifty, who had greatly distinguished himself in the last Sepoy revolt. He made India his home, only paying brief visits to England at rare intervals, and was almost as familiar as a native with the customs, history, and character of India and its people. But Phileas Fogg, who was not traveling but only describing a circumference, took no pains to inquire into these subjects. He was a solid body traversing an orbit around the terrestrial globe, according to the laws of rational mechanics. He was at this moment calculating in his mind the number of hours spent since his departure from London, and had it been in his nature to make a useless demonstration, would have rubbed his hands for satisfaction. Sir Francis Cromarty had observed the oddity of his travelling companion, although the only opportunity he had for studying him had been while he was dealing the cards and between two rubbers, and questioned himself whether a human heart really beat beneath this cold exterior, and whether Phileas Fogg had any sense of the beauties of nature. The brigadier-general was free to mentally confess that of all the eccentric persons he had ever met, none was comparable to this product of the exact sciences. Phileas Fogg had not concealed from Sir Francis his design of going round the world, nor the circumstances under which he set out, and the general only saw in the wager a useless eccentricity and a lack of sound common sense. In the way this strange gentleman was going on, he would leave the world without having done any good to himself or anybody else. An hour after leaving Bombay the train had passed the viaducts and the island of Salsetta, and had got into the open country. At Kalyan they reached the junction of the branch line which descends towards southeastern India by Kandala and Puna, and passing Pawel they entered the defiles of the mountains with their basalt bases and their summits crowned with thick and verdant forests. Phileas Fogg and Sir Francis Cromarty exchanged a few words from time to time, and now Sir Francis, reviving the conversation, observed, some years ago, Mr. Fogg, you would have met with a delay at this point, which would probably have lost you your wager. How so, Sir Francis? Because the railway stopped at the base of these mountains, which the passengers were obliged to cross in palaquins, or on ponies to Candala on the other side. 
"'Such a delay would not have deranged my plans in the least,' said Mr. Fogg. "'I have constantly foreseen the likelihood of certain obstacles.' "'But, Mr. Fogg,' pursued Sir Francis, "'you run the risk of having some difficulty about this worthy fellow's adventure at the pagoda.' Passepartout, his feet comfortably wrapped in his travelling blanket, was sound asleep, and did not dream that anybody was talking about him. The government is very severe upon that kind of offence. It takes particular care that the religious customs of the Indians should be respected, and if your servant were caught— Very well, Sir Francis, replied Mr. Fogg. If he had been caught he would have been condemned and punished, and then would have quietly returned to Europe. I don't see how this affair could have delayed his master. The conversation fell again. During the night the train left the mountains behind and passed Nasik, and the next day proceeded over the flat, well-cultivated country of the Kandish, with its straggling villages, above which rose the minarets of the pagodas. This fertile territory is watered by numerous small rivers and limpid streams, mostly tributaries of the Godavery. Passepartout, on waking and looking out, could not realize that he was actually crossing India in a railway train. The locomotive, guided by an English engineer and fed with English coal, threw out its smoke upon cotton, coffee, nutmeg, clove, and pepper plantations, while the steam curled in spirals around groups of palm trees, in the midst of which were seen picturesque bungalows, viharis, sort of abandoned monasteries, and marvellous temples enriched by the exhaustless ornamentation of Indian architecture. Then they came upon vast tracts extending to the horizon, with jungles inhabited by snakes and tigers, which fled at the noise of the train, succeeded by forests penetrated by the railway, and still haunted by elephants, which, with pensive eyes, gazed at the train as it passed. The travellers crossed beyond Milligam, the fatal country so often stained with blood by the sectaries of the goddess Kali. Not far off rose Alora with its graceful pagodas, and the famous Aurangabad, capital of the ferocious Aurangazeb, now the chief town of one of the detached provinces of the kingdom of the Nizam. It was thereabouts that Feringia, the Thugi chief, king of the stranglers, held his sway. These ruffians, united by a secret bond, strangled victims of every age in honor of the goddess death without ever shedding blood there was a period when this part of the country could scarcely be travelled over without corpses being found in every direction the english government has succeeded in greatly diminishing these murders though the thugis still exist and pursue the exercise of their horrible rites at half past twelve the train stopped at burhampur where Passepartout was able to purchase some Indian slippers, ornamented with false pearls, in which, with evident vanity, he proceeded to encase his feet. The travellers made a hasty breakfast and started off for Asurgur, after skirting for a little the banks of the small river Tapti, which empties into the Gulf of Cambrai near Surat. Passepartout was now plunged into absorbing reverie, up to his arrival at bombay he had entertained hopes that their journey would end there but now that they were plainly whirling across india at full speed a sudden change had come over the spirit of his dreams his old vagabond nature returned to him the fantastic ideas of his youth once more took possession of him he came to regard his master's project as intended in good earnest believed in the reality of the bet and therefore in the tour of the world and the necessity of making it without fail within the designated period. Already he began to worry about possible delays and accidents which might happen on the way. He recognized himself as being personally interested in the wager, and trembled at the thought that he might have been the means of losing it by his unpardonable folly of the night before. Being much less cool-headed than Mr. Fogg, he was much more restless, counting and recounting the days passed over, uttering maledictions when the train stopped, and accusing it of sluggishness, and mentally blaming Mr. Fogg for not having bribed the engineer. The worthy fellow was ignorant that while it was possible by such means to hasten the rate of a steamer, it could not be done on the railway. 
The train entered the defiles of the Satpur Mountains, which separate the Kandish from Bundelkund, towards evening. The next day Sir Francis Cromarty asked Passepartout what time it was, to which, on consulting his watch, he replied that it was three in the morning. This famous timepiece, always regulated on the Greenwich meridian, which was now some seventy-seven degrees westward, was at least four hours slow. Sir Francis corrected Passepartout's time, whereupon the latter made the same remark that he had done to fix, and upon the general insisting that the watch should be regulated in each new meridian, since he was constantly going eastward, that it is in the face of the sun, and therefore the days were shorter by four minutes for each degree gone over. Passepartout obstinately refused to alter his watch, which he kept at London time. It was an innocent delusion which could harm no one. The train stopped at eight o'clock in the midst of a glade some fifteen miles beyond Rothal, where there were several bungalows and workmen's cabins. The conductor, passing along the carriages, shouted, "'Passengers will get out here!' Phileas Fogg looked at Sir Francis Cromarty for an explanation, but the general could not tell what meant a halt in the midst of this forest of dates and acacias. Passepartout, not less surprised, rushed out and speedily returned, crying, "'Monsieur! Monsieur! No more railway!' "'What do you mean?' asked Sir Francis. "'I mean to say that the train isn't going on.' The general at once stepped out, while Phileas Fogg calmly followed him, and they proceeded together to the conductor. "'Where are we?' asked Sir Francis. "'At the hamlet of Colby. Do we stop here? Certainly the railway isn't finished.' "'What? Not finished?' No, there's still a matter of fifty miles to be laid from here to Allahabad, where the line begins again. But the papers announce the opening of the railway throughout. What would you have, officer? The papers were mistaken. Yet you sell tickets from Bombay to Calcutta, retorted Sir Francis, who was growing warm. No doubt, replied the conductor. But the passengers know that they must provide means of transportation for themselves from Colby to Allahabad. Sir Francis was furious. Passepartout would willingly have knocked the conductor down, and did not dare to look at his master. Sir Francis, said Mr. Fogg quietly, we will, if you please, look about for some means of conveyance to Allahabad. Mr. Fogg, this is a delay greatly to your disadvantage. No, Sir Francis, it was foreseen. What? You knew that the way? Not at all, but I knew that some obstacle or other would sooner or later arise on my route. Nothing, therefore, is lost. I have two days which I have already gained to sacrifice. A steamer leaves Calcutta for Hong Kong at noon on the 25th. This is the 22nd, and we shall reach Calcutta in time." There was nothing to say to so confident a response. It was but too true that the railway came to a termination at this point. The papers were like some watches which have a way of getting too fast, and had been premature in their announcement of the completion of the line. The greater part of the travellers were aware of this interruption, and leaving the train they began to engage such vehicles as the village could provide four-wheeled palkigaris, wagons drawn by zebus, carriages that looked like perambulating pagodas, palicans, ponies, and what not. Mr. Fogg and Sir Francis Cromarty, after searching the village from end to end, came back without having found anything. "'I shall go afoot,' said Phileas Fogg. Passepartout, who had now rejoined his master, made a wry grimace as he thought of his magnificent but too frail Indian shoes. Happily he too had been looking about him, and after a moment's hesitation said, "'Monsieur, I think I have found a means of conveyance.' "'What?' "'An elephant, an elephant that belongs to an Indian who lives but a hundred steps from here.' "'Let's go and see the elephant,' replied Mr. Fogg. They soon reached a small hut, near which, enclosed within some high palings, was the animal in question. An Indian came out of the hut, and at their request conducted them within the enclosure. The elephant, which its owner had reared not for a beast of burden but for warlike purposes, was half domesticated. The Indian had begun already, by often irritating him and feeding him every three months on sugar and butter, to impart to him a ferocity not in his nature, 
this method being often employed by those who train the Indian elephants for battle. Happily, however, for Mr. Fogg, the animal's instruction in this direction had not gone far, and the elephant still preserved his natural gentleness. Kiaoni, this was the name of the beast, could doubtless travel rapidly for a long time, and, in default of any other means of conveyance, Mr. Fogg resolved to hire him. But elephants are far from cheap in India, where they are becoming scarce. The males, which alone are suitable for circus shows, are much sought, especially as but few of them are domesticated. When, therefore, Mr. Fogg proposed to the Indian to hire Kiaoni, he refused point-blank. Mr. Fogg persisted, offering the excessive sum of ten pounds an hour for the loan of the beast to Allahabad. Refused. Twenty pounds? Refused also. Forty pounds? Still refused. Passepartout jumped at each advance, but the Indian declined to be tempted. Yet the offer was an alluring one, for supposing it took the elephant fifteen hours to reach Allahabad, his owner would receive no less than six hundred pounds sterling. Phileas Fogg, without getting in the least flurried, then proposed to purchase the animal outright, and at first offered a thousand pounds for him. The Indian, perhaps thinking he was going to make a great bargain, still refused. Sir Francis Cromarty took Mr. Fogg aside, and begged him to reflect before he went any further, to which that gentleman replied that he was not in the habit of acting rashly, that a bet of twenty thousand pounds was at stake that the elephant was absolutely necessary to him, and that he would secure him if he had to pay twenty times his value. Returning to the Indian, whose small sharp eyes, glistening with avarice, betrayed that with him it was only a question of how great a price he could obtain, Mr. Fogg offered first twelve hundred, then fifteen hundred, eighteen hundred, two thousand pounds. Passepartout, usually so rubicund, was fairly white with suspense, at two thousand pounds the Indian yielded. "'What a price! Good heavens!' cried Passepartout. "'For an elephant!' It only remained now to find a guide, which was comparatively easy. A young Parsee, with an intelligent face, offered his services, which Mr. Fogg accepted, promising so generous a reward as to materially stimulate his zeal. The elephant was led out and equipped. The Parsee, who was an accomplished elephant-driver, covered his back with a sort of saddle-cloth, and attached to each of his flanks some curiously uncomfortable howdahs. Phileas Fogg paid the Indian with some banknotes which he extracted from the famous carpet-bag, a proceeding that seemed to deprive poor Passepartout of his victuals. Then he offered to carry Sir Francis to Allahabad, which the brigadier gratefully accepted, as one traveller the more would not be likely to fatigue the gigantic beast. Provisions were purchased at Colby, and while Sir Francis and Mr. Fogg took the howdahs on either side, Passepartout got astride the saddle-cloth between them. The Parsee perched himself on the elephant's neck, and at nine o'clock they set out from the village, the animal marching off through the dense forest of palms by the shortest cut. End of chapter 11《Twelve of Around the World in Eighty Days》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《Around the World in Eighty Days》by Jules Verne, translated by George Makepeace Towell. Chapter Twelve, in which Phileas Fogg and his companions venture across the Indian forests and what ensued. In order to shorten the journey, the guide passed to the left of the line where the railway was still in process of being built. This line, owing to the capricious turnings of the Vindhya Mountains, did not pursue a straight course. The Parsee, who was quite familiar with the roads and paths in the district, declared that they would gain twenty miles by striking directly through the forest. Phileas Fogg and Sir Francis Cromarty plunged to the neck in the peculiar howdahs provided for them, were horribly jostled by the swift trotting of the elephant, spurred on as he was by the skillful Parsee. But they endured the discomfort with true British phlegm, talking little and scarcely able to catch a glimpse of each other. As for Passepartout, who was mounted on the beast's back, 
and received the direct force of each concussion as he trod along, he was very careful, in accordance with his master's advice, to keep his tongue from between his teeth, as it would otherwise have been bitten off short. The worthy fellow bounced from the elephant's neck to his rump, and vaulted like a clown on a springboard, yet he laughed in the midst of his bouncing, and from time to time took a piece of sugar out of his pocket and inserted it in Kiuni's trunk who received it without in the least slackening his regular trot. After two hours the guide stopped the elephant and gave him an hour for rest, during which Keone, after quenching his thirst at a neighboring spring, set to devouring the branches and shrubs round about him. Neither Sir Francis nor Mr. Fogg regretted the delay, and both descended with a feeling of relief. "'Why, he's made of iron!' exclaimed the general gazing admiringly on Keone. "'Of forged iron,' replied Passepartout, as he set about preparing a hasty breakfast. At noon the Parsee gave the signal of departure. The country soon presented a very savage aspect. Copses of dates and dwarf palms succeeded the dense forests, then vast dry plains dotted with scanty shrubs and sown with great blocks of cyanite. All this portion of Bundelkund, which is little frequented by travelers, is inhabited by a fanatical population, hardened in the most horrible practices of the Hindu faith. The English have not been able to secure complete dominion over this territory, which is subjected to the influence of Rajas, whom it is almost impossible to reach in their inaccessible mountain fastnesses. The travelers several times saw bands of ferocious Indians, who, when they perceived the elephant striding across country, made angry and threatening motions. The Parsee avoided them as much as possible. Few animals were observed on the route. Even the monkeys hurried from their path with contortions and grimaces which convulsed Passepartout with laughter. In the midst of his gaiety, however, one thought troubled the worthy servant. What would Mr. Fogg do with the elephant when he got to Allahabad? Would he carry him on with him? Impossible. The cost of transporting him would make him ruinously expensive. Would he sell him, or set him free? The estimable beast certainly deserved some consideration. Should Mr. Fogg choose to make him, Passepartout, a present of Keone, he would be very much embarrassed, and these thoughts did not cease worrying him for a long time. The principal chain of the Vindhias was crossed by eight in the evening, and another halt was made on the northern slope in a ruined bungalow. They had gone nearly twenty-five miles that day, and an equal distance still separated them from the station of Allahabad. The night was cold. The Parsee lit a fire in the bungalow with a few dry branches, and the warmth was very grateful. Provisions purchased at Colby sufficed for supper, and the travelers ate ravenously. The conversation, beginning with a few disconnected phrases, soon gave place to loud and steady snores. The guide watched Keone, who slept standing, bolstering himself against the trunk of a large tree. Nothing occurred during the night to disturb the slumberers, although occasional growls from panthers and chatterings of monkeys broke the silence. The more formidable beasts made no cries or hostile demonstration against the occupants of the bungalow. Sir Francis slept heavily, like an honest soldier overcome with fatigue. Passepartout was wrapped in uneasy dreams of the bouncing of the day before. As for Mr. Fogg, he slumbered as peacefully as if he had been in his serene mansion in Seville Row. The journey was resumed at six in the morning. The guide hoped to reach Allahabad by evening. In that case, Mr. Fogg would only lose a part of the forty-eight hours saved since the beginning of the tour. Keone, resuming his rapid gait, soon descended the lower spurs of the Vinhias, and towards noon they passed by the village of Callinger, on the Canai, one of the branches of the Ganges. The guide avoided inhabited places, thinking it safer to keep the open country, which lies along the first depressions of the basin of the great river. Allahabad was now only twelve miles to the northeast. They stopped under a clump of bananas, the fruit of which, as healthy as bread and as succulent as cream, was amply partaken of and appreciated. At two o'clock the guide entered a thick forest which extended several miles. He preferred to travel under cover of the woods. 
They had not as yet had any unpleasant encounters, and the journey seemed on the point of being successfully accomplished, when the elephant, becoming restless, suddenly stopped. It was then four o'clock. "'What's the matter?' asked Sir Francis, putting out his head. "'I don't know, officer,' replied the Parsee, listening attentively to a confused murmur which came through the thick branches. The murmur soon became more distinct. It now seemed like a distant concert of human voices accompanied by brass instruments. Passepartout was all eyes and ears. Mr. Fogg patiently waited without a word. The Parsee jumped to the ground, fastened the elephant to a tree, and plunged into the thicket. He soon returned, saying, "'A procession of Brahmins is coming this way. We must prevent their seeing us, if possible.' The guide unloosed the elephant and led him into a thicket, at the same time asking the travellers not to stir. He held himself ready to bestride the animal at a moment's notice, should flight become necessary, but he evidently thought that the procession of the faithful would pass without perceiving them amid the thick foliage in which they were wholly concealed. The discordant tones of the voices and instruments drew nearer, and now droning songs mingled with the sound of the tambourines and cymbals. The head of the procession soon appeared beneath the trees a hundred paces away, and the strange figures who performed the religious ceremony were easily distinguished through the branches. First came the priests with mitres on their heads, and clothed in long lace robes, they were surrounded by men, women, and children, who sang a kind of lugubrious psalm, interpreted at regular intervals by the tambourines and cymbals, while behind them was drawn a car with large wheels, the spokes of which represented serpents entwined with each other. Upon the car, which was drawn by four richly comparisoned zebus, stood a hideous statue with four arms, the body colored a dull red, with haggard eyes, disheveled hair, protruding tongue and lips tinted with betel. It stood upright upon the figure of a prostrate and headless giant. Sir Francis, recognizing the statue, whispered, The goddess of Kali, the goddess of love and death. Of death, perhaps, muttered back Passepartout, but of love, that ugly old hag, never. The Parsee made a motion to keep silence. A group of old fakers were capering and making a wild ado round the statue. These were striped with ochre and covered with cuts whence their blood issued drop by drop, stupid fanatics who, in the great Indian ceremonies, still throw themselves under the wheels of juggernaut. Some Brahmins, clad in all the sumptuousness of Oriental apparel, and leading a woman who faltered at every step, followed. This woman was young and as fair as a European. Her head and neck, shoulders, ears, arms, hands, and toes were loaded down with jewels and gems, with bracelets, earrings, and rings, while a tunic bordered with gold and covered with a light muslin robe betrayed the outline of her form. The guards who followed the young woman presented a violent contrast to her, armed as they were with naked sabers hung at their waists and long damascene pistols, and bearing a corpse on a palican. It was the body of an old man, gorgeously arrayed in the habiliments of a raja, wearing, as in life, a turban embroidered with pearls, a robe of tissue of silk and gold, a scarf of cashmere sewed with diamonds, and the magnificent weapons of a Hindu prince. Next came the musicians, and a rear-guard of capering fakers, whose cries sometimes drowned the noise of the instruments. These closed the procession. Sir Francis watched the procession with a sad countenance, and turning to the guide said, A sutty. The Parsee nodded and put his finger to his lips. The procession slowly wound under the trees, and soon its last ranks disappeared in the depths of the wood. The songs gradually died away. Occasionally cries were heard in the distance, until at last all was silence again. Phileas Fogg had heard what Sir Francis said and as soon as the procession had disappeared, asked, What is a sati? A sati, returned the general, is a human sacrifice, but a voluntary one. The woman you have just seen will be burned to-morrow at the dawn of day. Oh, the scoundrels! cried Passepartout, who could not repress his indignation. And the corpse, asked Mr. Fogg, is that of the prince her husband, said the guide, an independent raja of Bundlecund. 
"'Is it possible,' resumed Phileas Fogg, his voice betraying not the least emotion, "'that these barbarous customs still exist in India, and that the English have been unable to put a stop to them? "'These sacrifices do not occur in the larger portion of India.' replied sir francis but we have no power over these savage territories and especially here in bundlecund the whole district north of the vindias is the theatre of incessant murders and pillage the poor wretch exclaimed passepartout to be burned alive yes returned sir francis burned alive and if she were not you cannot conceive what treatment she would be obliged to submit to from her relatives they would shave off her hair, feed her on a scanty allowance of rice, treat her with contempt. She would be looked upon as an unclean creature, and would die in some corner like a scurvy dog. The prospect of so frightful an existence drives these poor creatures to the sacrifice much more than love or religious fanaticism. Sometimes, however, the sacrifice is really voluntary and it requires the active interference of the government to prevent it. Several years ago, when I was living at Bombay, a young widow asked permission of the governor to be burned along with her husband's body, but, as you may imagine, he refused. The woman left the town, took refuge with an independent rajah, and there carried out her self-devoted purpose. While Sir Francis was speaking, the guide shook his head several times, and now said, the sacrifice which will take place tomorrow at dawn is not a voluntary one. How do you know? Everybody knows about this affair in Bundlecund. But the wretched creature did not seem to be making any resistance, observed Sir Francis. That was because they had intoxicated her with fumes of hemp and opium. But where are they taking her? To the pagoda of Pillagi, two miles from here. She will pass the night there and the sacrifice will take place to-morrow at the first light of dawn the guide now led the elephant out of the thicket and leaped upon his neck just at the moment that he was about to urge keone forward with a peculiar whistle mr fogg stopped him and turning to sir francis cromarty said suppose we save this woman save the woman mr fogg i have yet twelve hours to spare i can devote them to that why, you are a man of heart. Sometimes, replied Phileas Fogg quietly, when I have the time. End of chapter 12Translated by George Makepeace Towell. Chapter 13. In which Passepartout receives a new proof that fortune favors the brave. The project was a bold one, full of difficulty, perhaps impracticable. Mr. Fogg was going to risk life, or at least liberty, and therefore the success of his tour. But he did not hesitate, and he found in Sir Francis Cromarty an enthusiastic ally. As for Passepartout, he was ready for anything that might be proposed. His master's idea charmed him. He perceived a heart, a soul, under that icy exterior. He began to love Phileas Fogg. There remained the guide. What course would he adopt? Would he not take part with the Indians? In default of his assistance it was necessary to be assured of his neutrality. Sir Francis frankly put the question to him. Officers, replied the guide, I am a Parsee, and this woman is a Parsee. Command me as you will. Excellent, said Mr. Fogg. However, resumed the guide, it is certain not only that we shall risk our lives, but horrible tortures if we are taken. That is foreseen, replied Mr. Fogg. I think we must wait till night before acting. I think so, said the guide. The worthy Indian then gave some account of the victim, who, he said, was a celebrated beauty of the Parsee race, and the daughter of a wealthy Bombay merchant. She had received a thoroughly English education in that city, and from her manners and intelligence would be thought a European. Her name was Aouda. Left an orphan, she was married against her will to the old Raja of Bundlecund, 
and knowing the fate that awaited her, she escaped and was retaken, and devoted by the Raja's relatives, who had an interest in her death, to the sacrifice from which it seemed she could not escape. The Parsee's narrative only confirmed Mr. Fogg and his companions in their generous design. It was decided that the guide should direct the elephant towards the pagoda of Pillagi, which he accordingly approached as quickly as possible. They halted, half an hour afterwards, in a copse, some five hundred feet from the pagoda, where they were well concealed, but they could hear the groans and cries of the fakers distinctly. They then discussed the means of getting at the victim. The guide was familiar with the pagoda of Pillagi, in which, as he declared, the young woman was imprisoned. Could they enter any of its doors while the whole party of Indians was plunged in a drunken sleep, or was it safer to attempt to make a hole in the walls? This could only be determined at the moment and the place themselves, but it was certain that the abduction must be made that night, and not when, at break of day, the victim was led to her funeral pyre. Then no human intervention could save her. As soon as night fell, about six o'clock, they decided to make a reconnaissance around the pagoda. The cries of the fakers were just ceasing. The Indians were in the act of plunging themselves into the drunkenness caused by liquid opium mingled with hemp, and it might be possible to slip between them to the temple itself. The Parsee, leading the others, noiselessly crept through the wood, and in ten minutes they found themselves on the banks of a small stream whence by the light of the rosin torches they perceived a pyre of wood, on the top of which lay the embalmed body of the Raja, which was to be burned with his wife. The pagoda, whose minarets loomed above the trees in the deepening dusk, stood a hundred steps away. "'Come,' whispered the guide. He slipped more cautiously than ever through the brush, followed by his companions. The silence around was only broken by the low murmuring of the wind among the branches. Soon the Parsee stopped on the borders of the glade, which was lit up by the torches. The ground was covered by groups of the Indians, motionless in their drunken sleep. It seemed a battlefield strewn with the dead. Men, women, and children lay together. In the background, among the trees, the pagoda of Pillagi loomed distinctly. Much to the guide's disappointment, the guards of the Raja, lighted by torches, were watching at the doors and marching to and fro with naked sabers. Probably the priests, too, were watching within. The Parsee, now convinced that it was impossible to force an entrance to the temple, advanced no farther, but led his companions back again. Phileas Fogg and Sir Francis Cromarty also saw that nothing could be attempted in that direction. They stopped and engaged in a whispered colloquy. "'It is only eight now,' said the brigadier, "'and these guards may also go to sleep.' "'It is not impossible,' returned the Parsee. They lay down at the foot of a tree and waited. The time seemed long. The guide ever and anon left them to take an observation on the edge of the wood, but the guards watched steadily by the glare of the torches and a dim light crept through the windows of the pagoda. They waited till midnight, but no change took place among the guards, and it became apparent that their yielding to sleep could not be counted on. The other plan must be carried out. An opening in the walls of the pagoda must be made. It remained to ascertain whether the priests were watching by the side of their victim as assiduously as were the soldiers at the door. After a last consultation, the guide announced that he was ready for the attempt, and advanced, followed by the others. They took a roundabout way so as to get at the pagoda on the rear. They reached the walls about half-past twelve, without having met anyone. Here there was no guard, nor were there either windows or doors. The night was dark. The moon on the wane scarcely left the horizon and was covered with heavy clouds. The height of the trees deepened the darkness. It was not enough to reach the walls. An opening in them must be accomplished, and to attain this purpose the party only had their pocket-knives. Happily the temple walls were built of brick and wood, which could be penetrated with little difficulty. After one brick had been taken out, the rest would yield easily. They set noiselessly to work and the Parsee on one side and Passepartout on the other began to loosen the bricks so as to make an aperture two feet wide. 
They were getting on rapidly when suddenly a cry was heard in the interior of the temple, followed almost instantly by other cries replying from the outside. Passepartout and the guide stopped. Had they been heard? Was the alarm being given? Common prudence urged them to retire, and they did so, followed by Phileas Fogg and Sir Francis. They again hid themselves in the wood, and waited till the disturbance, whatever it might be, ceased, holding themselves ready to resume their attempt without delay. But awkwardly enough the guards now appeared at the rear of the temple, and there installed themselves in readiness to prevent a surprise. It would be difficult to describe the disappointment of the party, thus interrupted in their work. They could not now reach the victim. How, then, could they save her? Sir Francis shook his fist. Passepartout was beside himself, and the guide gnashed his teeth with rage. The tranquil fog waited without betraying any emotion. "'We have nothing to do but to go away,' whispered Sir Francis. "'Nothing but to go away,' echoed the guide. "'Stop,' said Fogg. "'I am only due at Allahabad tomorrow before noon.' "'But what can you hope to do?' asked Sir Francis. "'In a few hours it will be daylight, and the chance which now seems lost may present itself at the last moment.' Sir Francis would have liked to read Phileas Fogg's eyes. What was this cool Englishman thinking of? Was he planning to make a rush for the young woman at the very moment of the sacrifice and boldly snatch her from her executioners? This would be utter folly, and it was hard to admit that Fogg was such a fool. Sir Francis consented, however, to remain to the end of this terrible drama. The guide led them to the rear of the glade, where they were able to observe the sleeping groups. Meanwhile, Passepartout, who had perched himself on the lower branches of a tree, was resolving an idea which had at first struck him like a flash, and which was now firmly lodged in his brain. He had commenced by saying to himself, What folly! And then he repeated, Why not, after all? It's a chance, perhaps the only one, and with such thoughts. Thinking thus, he slipped with the suppleness of a serpent to the lowest branches, the ends of which bent almost to the ground. The hours passed, and the lighter shades now announced the approach of day, though it was not yet light. This was the moment. The slumbering multitude became animated. The tambourine sounded. Songs and cries arose. The hour of the sacrifice had come. The doors of the pagoda swung open, and a bright light escaped from its interior, in the midst of which Mr. Fogg and Sir Francis espied the victim. She seemed, having shaken off the stupor of intoxication, to be striving to escape from her executioner. Sir Francis's heart throbbed, and, convulsively seizing Mr. Fogg's hand, found in it an open knife. Just at this moment the crowd began to move. The young woman had again fallen into a stupor caused by the fumes of hemp, and passed among the fakers who escorted her with their wild, religious cries. Phileas Fogg and his companions, mingling in the rear ranks of the crowd, followed, and in two minutes they reached the banks of the stream and stopped fifty paces from the pyre, upon which still lay the Raja's corpse. In the semi-obscurity they saw the victim, quite senseless, stretched out beside her husband's body. Then a torch was brought, and the wood, heavily soaked with oil, instantly took fire. At this moment Sir Francis and the guide seized Phileas Fogg, who in an instant of mad generosity was about to rush upon the pyre. But he had quickly pushed them aside when the whole scene suddenly changed. A cry of terror arose. The whole multitude prostrated themselves, terror-stricken on the ground. The old Raja was not dead then, since he rose of a sudden like a specter, took up his wife in his arms, and descended from the pyre in the midst of the clouds of smoke which only heightened his ghostly appearance. Fakers and soldiers and priests, seized with instant terror, lay there with their faces on the ground, not daring to lift their eyes and behold such a prodigy. The inanimate victim was borne along by the vigorous arms which supported her, and which she did not seem in the least to burden. Mr. Fogg and Sir Francis stood erect, the Parsee bowed his head, and Passepartout was, no doubt, scarcely less stupefied. The resuscitated Raja approached Sir Francis and Mr. Fogg, and in an abrupt tone said, Let us be off! 
It was Passepartout himself who had slipped upon the pyre in the midst of the smoke, and, profiting by the still overhanging darkness, had delivered the young woman from death. It was Passepartout who, playing his part with a happy audacity, had passed through the crowd amid the general terror. A moment after all four of the party had disappeared in the woods, and the elephant was bearing them away at a rapid pace. But the cries and noise, and a ball which whizzed through Phileas Fogg's hat, apprised them that the trick had been discovered. The old Raja's body, indeed, now appeared upon the burning pyre, and the priests, recovered from their terror, perceived that an abduction had taken place. They hastened into the forest, followed by the soldiers, who fired a volley after the fugitives. But the latter rapidly increased the distance between them, and ere long found themselves beyond the reach of the bullets and arrows. End of chapter 13《Chapter Fourteen of Around the World in Eighty Days》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《Around the World in Eighty Days》by Jules Verne, translated by George Makepeace Towel. Chapter Fourteen, in which Phileas Fogg descends the whole length of the beautiful valley of the Ganges without ever thinking of seeing it. The rash exploit had been accomplished and for an hour Passepartout laughed gaily at his success. Sir Francis pressed the worthy fellow's hand, and his master said, "'Well done,' which from him was high commendation, to which Passepartout replied that all the credit of the affair belonged to Mr. Fogg. As for him, he had only been struck with a queer idea, and he laughed to think that for a few moments he, Passepartout, the ex-gymnast, ex-sergeant fireman, had been the spouse of a charming woman a venerable embalmed raja as for the young indian woman she had been unconscious throughout of what was passing and now wrapped up in a travelling blanket was reposing in one of the howdahs the elephant thanks to the skilful guidance of the parsee was advancing rapidly through the still darksome forest and an hour after leaving the pagoda had crossed a vast plain they made a halt at seven o'clock the young woman being still in a state of complete prostration. The guide made her a drink, a little brandy and water, but the drowsiness which stupefied her could not yet be shaken off. Sir Francis, who was familiar with the effects of the intoxication produced by the fumes of hemp, reassured his companions on her account. But he was more disturbed at the prospect of her future fate. He told Phileas Fogg that should Aouda remain in India, she would inevitably fall again into the hands of her executioners. These fanatics were scattered throughout the country, and would, despite the English police, recover their victim at Madras, Bombay, or Calcutta. She would only be safe by quitting India for ever. Phileas Fogg replied that he would reflect upon the matter. The station at Allahabad was reached about ten o'clock and the interrupted line of railway being resumed would enable them to reach Calcutta in less than twenty-four hours. Phileas Fogg would thus be able to arrive in time to take the steamer which left Calcutta the next day, October twenty-fifth, at noon, for Hong Kong. The young woman was placed in one of the waiting-rooms of the station, whilst Passepartout was charged with purchasing for her various articles of toilet, a dress, shawl, and some furs, for which his master gave him unlimited credit. Passepartout started off forthwith, and found himself in the streets of Allahabad, that is, the city of God, one of the most venerated in India, being built at the junction of the two sacred rivers, Ganges and Jumna, the waters of which attract pilgrims from every part of the peninsula. The Ganges, according to the legends of the Ramayana, rises in heaven, whence, owing to Brahma's agency, it descends to the earth. Passepartout made it a point, as he made his purchases, to take a good look at the city. It was formerly defended by a noble fort, which has since become a state prison. Its commerce has dwindled away, and Passepartout in vain looked about him for such a bazaar as he used to frequent in Regent Street. At last he came upon an elderly, crusty Jew, who sold second-hand articles, and from whom he purchased a dress of scotch stuff, a large mantle, and a fine otter-skin pelisse, 
for which he did not hesitate to pay seventy-five pounds. He then returned triumphantly to the station. The influence to which the priests of Pillagi had subjected Aouda began gradually to yield, and she became more herself, so that her fine eyes resumed all their soft Indian expression. When the poet king Ukaf Udal celebrates the charms of the queen Amanagara, he speaks thus. Her shining tresses, divided in two parts, encircle the harmonious contour of her white and delicate cheeks, brilliant in their glow and freshness. Her ebony brows have the form and charm of the bow of Kama, the god of love, and beneath her long silken lashes the purest reflections and a celestial light swim as in the sacred lakes of Himalaya, in the black pupils of her great clear eyes. Her teeth, fine, equal, and white, glitter between her smiling lips like dewdrops in a passion flower's half-enveloped breast. Her delicately formed ears, her vermilion hands, her little feet curved and tender as the lotus bud, glitter with the brilliancy of the loveliest pearls of Ceylon, the most dazzling diamonds of Golconda. Her narrow and supple waist, which a hand may clasp around, sets forth the outline of her rounded figure and the beauty of her bosom, where youth in its flower displays the wealth of its treasures. And beneath the silken folds of her tunic she seems to have been modeled in pure silver by the godlike hand of Vic Barkarma, the immortal sculptor. It is enough to say, without applying this poetical rhapsody to Aouda, that she was a charming woman in all the European acceptation of the phrase. She spoke English with great purity, and the guide had not exaggerate in saying that the young Parsi had been transformed by her bringing up. The train was about to start from Allahabad, and Mr. Fogg proceeded to pay the guide the price agreed upon for his service, and not a farthing more, which astonished Passepartout, who remembered all that his master owed to the guide's devotion. He had indeed risked his life in the adventure at Pillagi and if he should be caught afterwards by the Indians, he would with difficulty escape their vengeance. Kioni also must be disposed of. What should be done with the elephant, which had been so dearly purchased? Phileas Fogg had already determined this question. Parsi, said he to the guide, you have been serviceable and devoted. I have paid for your service, but not for your devotion. Would you like to have this elephant? He is yours. The guide's eyes glistened. "'Your honor is giving me a fortune,' cried he. "'Take him, guide,' returned Mr. Fogg, "'and I shall still be your debtor.' "'Good!' exclaimed Passepartout. "'Take him, friend. Kioni is a brave and faithful beast.' And going up to the elephant, he gave him several lumps of sugar, saying, "'Here, Kioni, here, here!' The elephant grunted out his satisfaction, and clasping Passepartout around the waist with his trunk, lifted him as high as his head. Passepartout, not in the least alarmed, caressed the animal, which replaced him gently on the ground. Soon after, Phileas Fogg, Sir Francis Cromarty, and Passepartout, installed in a carriage with Aouda, who had the best seat, were whirling at full speed towards Benares. It was a run of eighty miles, and was accomplished in two hours. During the journey the young woman fully recovered her senses. What was her astonishment to find herself in this carriage on the railway, dressed in European habiliments, and with travellers who were quite strangers to her? Her companions first set about fully reviving her with a little liquor, and then Sir Francis narrated to her what had passed, dwelling upon the courage with which Phileas Fogg had not hesitated to risk his life to save her, and recounting the happy sequel of the venture, the result of Passepartout's rash idea. Mr. Fogg said nothing, while Passepartout, abashed, kept repeating that it wasn't worth telling. Aouda pathetically thanked her deliverers, rather with tears than words. Her fine eyes interpreted her gratitude better than her lips. Then, as her thoughts strayed back to the scene of the sacrifice, and recalled the dangers which still menaced her, she shuddered with terror. Phileas Fogg understood what was passing in Aouda's mind, and offered, in order to reassure her, to escort her to Hong Kong, where she might remain safely until the affair was hushed up, an offer which she eagerly and gratefully accepted. She had, it seems, a Parsi relation who was one of the principal merchants of Hong Kong, which is wholly an English city, 
though on an island on the Chinese coast. At half-past twelve the train stopped at Benares. The Brahmin legends assert that this city is built on the side of the ancient Kasi, which, like Mahomet's tomb, was once suspended between heaven and earth. Though the Benares of today, which the Orientalists call the Athens of India, stands quite unpoetically on the solid earth, Passepartout caught glimpses of its brick houses and clay huts, giving an aspect of desolation to the place as the train entered it. Benares was Sir Francis Cromarty's destination, the troops he was rejoining being encamped some miles northward of the city. He bade adieu to Phileas Fogg, wishing him all success, and expressing the hope that he would come that way again in a less original but more profitable fashion. Mr. Fogg lightly pressed him by the hand. The parting of Aouda, who did not forget what she owed to Sir Francis, betrayed more warmth and as for Passepartout, he received a hearty shake of the hand from the gallant general. The railway, on leaving Benares, passed for a while along the valley of the Ganges. Through the windows of their carriage the travellers had glimpses of the diversified landscape of Bihar, with its mountains clothed in verdure, its fields of barley, wheat, and corn, its jungles peopled with green alligators, its neat villages, and its still thickly-leaved forests. Elephants were bathing in the waters of the sacred river, and groups of Indians, despite the advanced season and chilly air, were performing solemnly their pious ablutions. These were fervent Brahmins, the bitterest foes of Buddhism, their deities being Vishnu, the solar god, Shiva, the divine impersonation of natural forces, and Brahma, the supreme ruler of priests and legislators. What would these divinities think of India, anglicized as it is today, with steamers whistling and scudding along the Ganges, frightening the gulls which float upon its surface, the turtles swarming along its banks, and the faithful dwelling upon its borders? The panorama passed before their eyes like a flash, save when the steam concealed it fitfully from the view. The travelers could scarcely discern the fort of Chupini, twenty miles south westward from Benares, the ancient stronghold of the Rajas of Bihar, or Gazapur and its famous rose-water factories, or the tomb of Lord Cornwallis rising on the left bank of the Ganges, the fortified town of Buxar or Patna, a large manufacturing and trading place, where is held the principal opium market of India, or Mong here, a more than European town, for it is as English as Manchester or Birmingham with its iron foundries, edge-tool factories, and high chimneys puffing clouds of black smoke heavenward. Night came on, the train passed on at full speed, in the midst of the roaring of the tigers, bears, and wolves, which fled before the locomotive, and the marvels of Bengal, Golconda, Ruan Gaur, Murshidabad, the ancient capital, Burdwan, Hugli, and the French town of Chandernagor, where Passport who would have been proud to see his country's flag flying, were hidden from their view in the darkness. Calcutta was reached at seven in the morning, and the packet left for Hong Kong at noon, so that Phileas Fogg had five hours before him. According to his journal, he was due at Calcutta on the 25th of October, and that was the exact date of his actual arrival. He was, therefore, neither behind hand nor ahead of time. The two days gained between London and Bombay had been lost, as had been seen in the journey across India, but it is not to be supposed that Phileas Fogg regretted them. End of chapter 14「Chapter 15 of Around the World in Eighty Days » This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne Translated by George Makepeace Towell Chapter 15 In which the bag of banknotes disgorges some thousands of pounds more. The train entered the station, and Passepartout, jumping out first, was followed by Mr. Fogg, who assisted his fair companion to descend. Phileas Fogg intended to proceed at once to the Hong Kong steamer in order to get Aouda comfortably settled for the voyage. 
He was unwilling to leave her while they were still on dangerous ground. Just as he was leaving the station, a policeman came up to him and said, "'Mr. Phileas Fogg?' "'I am he.' "'Is this man your servant?' added the policeman, pointing to Passepartout. "'Yes.' "'Be so good, both of you, as to follow me.' Mr. Fogg betrayed no surprise whatever. The policeman was a representative of the law, and law is sacred to an Englishman. Passepartout tried to reason about the matter, but the policeman tapped him with his stick, and Mr. Fogg made him a signal to obey. "'May this young lady go with us?' asked he. "'She may,' replied the policeman. Mr. Fogg, Aouda, and Passepartout were conducted to a palcagari, a sort of four-wheeled carriage, drawn by two horses in which they took their places and were driven away. No one spoke during the twenty minutes which elapsed before they reached their destination. They first passed through the black town, with its narrow streets, its miserable dirty huts and squalid population, then through the European town, which presented a relief in its bright brick mansions, shaded by coconut trees and bristling with masts, where, although it was early morning, elegantly dressed horsemen and handsome equipages were passing back and forth. The carriage stopped before a modest-looking house, which, however, did not have the appearance of a private mansion. The policeman, having requested his prisoners, for so truly they might be called, to descend, conducted them into a room with barred windows, and said, "'You will appear before Judge Obadiah at half-past eight. He then retired and closed the door. "'Why, we are prisoners!' exclaimed Passepartout, falling into a chair." Aouda, with an emotion she tried to conceal, said to Mr. Fogg, "'Sir, you must lead me to my fate. It is on my account that you receive this treatment. It is for having saved me.' Phileas Fogg contented himself with saying that it was impossible. It was quite unlikely that he should be arrested for preventing a sutty. The complainants would not dare present themselves with such a charge. There was some mistake.' Moreover, he would not in any event abandon Aouda, but would escort her to Hong Kong. "'But the steamer leaves at noon,' observed Passepartout nervously. "'We shall be on board by noon,' replied his master placidly. It was said so positively that Passepartout could not help muttering to himself, "'Parbleu, that's certain. Before noon we shall be on board.' But he was by no means reassured." At half-past eight the door opened, the policeman appeared, and, requesting them to follow him, led the way to an adjoining hall. It was evidently a courtroom, and a crowd of Europeans and natives already occupied the rear of the apartment. Mr. Fogg and his two companions took their places on a bench opposite the desks of the magistrate and his clerk. Immediately after, Judge Obadiah, a fat, round man, followed by the clerk, entered. He proceeded to take down a wig which was hanging on a nail and put it hurriedly on his head. "'The first case,' said he, then, putting his hand to his head, exclaimed, "'Eh, this is not my wig.' "'No, your worship,' returned the clerk. "'It is mine. My dear Mr. Oysterpuff, how can a judge give a wise sentence in a clerk's wig?' The wigs were exchanged. Passepartout was getting nervous for the hands on the face of the big clock over the judge seemed to go around with terrible rapidity. "'The first case,' repeated Judge Obadiah. "'Phileas Fogg?' demanded Oyster Puff. "'I am here,' replied Mr. Fogg. "'Passepartout!' "'Present,' responded Passepartout. "'Good,' said the judge. "'You have been looked for, prisoners, for two days on the trains from Bombay. But of what are we accused?' asked Passepartout impatiently. "'You are about to be informed.' "'I am an English subject, sir,' said Mr. Fogg, "'and I have the right. Have you been ill-treated?' "'Not at all. Very well. Let the complainants come in.' A door was swung open by order of the judge, and three Indian priests entered. "'That's it,' muttered Passepartout. "'These are the rogues who were going to burn our young lady.' The priests took their places in front of the judge, and the clerk proceeded to read in a loud voice a complaint of sacrilege against Phileas Fogg and his servant, who were accused of having violated a place held consecrated by the Brahmin religion. "'You hear the charge?' asked the judge. 
"'Yes, sir,' replied Mr. Fogg, consulting his watch. "'And I admit it. You admit it? I admit it, and I wish to hear these priests admit, in their turn, what they were going to do at the pagoda of Pillagei. The priests looked at each other. They did not seem to understand what was said. "'Yes,' cried Passepartout warmly, "'at the pagoda of Pillagei, where they were on the point of burning their victim.' The judge stared with astonishment, and the priests were stupefied. "'What victim?' said Judge Obadiah. "'Burn whom? In Bombay itself?' "'Bombay!' cried Passepartout. "'Certainly we are not talking of the pagoda of Pillagei, but of the pagoda of Malabar Hill at Bombay. "'And as proof,' added the clerk, "'here are the desecrator's very shoes which he left behind him,' whereupon he placed a pair of shoes on his desk. "'My shoes!' cried Passepartout, in his surprise permitting this imprudent exclamation to escape him. The confusion of master and man, who had quite forgotten the affair at Bombay, for which they were now detained at Calcutta, may be imagined. Fix, the detective, had foreseen the advantage which Passepartout's escapade gave him, and, delaying his departure for twelve hours, had consulted the priests of Malabar Hill. Knowing that the English authorities dealt very severely with this kind of misdemeanor, he promised them a goodly sum in damages, and sent them forward to Calcutta by the next train. Owing to the delay caused by the rescue of the young widow, Fix and the priest reached the Indian capital before Mr. Fogg and his servant, the magistrates having been already warned by a dispatch to arrest them should they arrive. Fix's disappointment when he learned that Phileas Fogg had not made his appearance in Calcutta may be imagined. He made up his mind that the robber had stopped somewhere on the route and taken refuge in the southern provinces. For twenty-four hours Fix watched the station with feverish anxiety. At last he was rewarded by seeing Mr. Fogg and Passepartout arrive, accompanied by a young woman, whose presence he was wholly at a loss to explain. He hastened for a policeman, and this was how the party came to be arrested and brought before Judge Obadiah. Had Passepartout been a little less preoccupied, he would have espied the detective ensconced in a corner of the courtroom, watching the proceedings with an interest easily understood, for the warrant had failed to reach him at Calcutta, as it had done at Bombay and Suez. Judge Obadiah had, unfortunately, caught Passepartout's rash exclamation, which the poor fellow would have given the world to recall. "'The facts are admitted?' asked the judge. "'Admitted,' replied Mr. Fogg coldly. "'Inasmuch,' resumed the judge, "'as the English law protects equally and sternly the religions of the Indian people, and as the man Passepartout has admitted that he violated the sacred pagoda of Malabar Hill at Bombay on the 20th of October, I condemn the said Passepartout to imprisonment for fifteen days and a fine of three hundred pounds. Three hundred pounds! cried Passepartout, startled at the largeness of the sum. Silence! shouted the constable. And inasmuch, continued the judge, as it is not proved that the act was not done by the connivance of the master with the servant, and as the master in any case must be held responsible for the acts of his paid servant, I condemn Phileas Fogg to a week's imprisonment and a fine of one hundred and fifty pounds. Fix rubbed his hands softly with satisfaction. If Phileas Fogg could be detained in Calcutta a week, it would be more than time for the warrant to arrive. Passepartout was stupefied. This sentence ruined his master. A wager of twenty thousand pounds lost because he, like a precious fool, had gone into that abominable pagoda. Phileas Fogg, as self-composed as if the judgment did not in the least concern him, did not even lift his eyebrows while it was being pronounced. Just as the clerk was calling the next case, he rose and said, "'I offer bail.' "'You have that right,' returned the judge. Fix's blood ran cold, but he resumed his composure when he heard the judge announce that the bail required for each prisoner would be one thousand pounds. "'I will pay it at once,' said Mr. Fogg, taking a roll of bank bills from the carpet-bag which Passepartout had by him and placing them on the clerk's desk. "'This sum will be restored to you upon your release from prison,' said the judge. "'Meanwhile you are liberated on bail.' 
"'Come,' said Phileas Fogg to his servant. "'But let them at least give me back my shoes,' cried Passepartout angrily. "'Ah, these are pretty dear shoes,' he muttered as they were handed to him. "'More than a thousand pounds apiece. Besides, they pinch my feet.' Mr. Fogg, offering his arm to Aouda, then departed, followed by the crestfallen Passepartout. Fix still nourished hopes that the robber would not, after all, leave the two thousand pounds behind him, but would decide to serve out his week in jail, and issued forth on Mr. Fogg's traces. That gentleman took a carriage, and the party were soon landed on one of the quays. The Rangoon was moored half a mile off in the harbor, its signal of departure hoisted at the masthead. Eleven o'clock was striking. Mr. Fogg was an hour in advance of time. Fix saw them leave the carriage and push off in a boat for the steamer, and stamped his feet with disappointment. "'The rascal is off after all!' he exclaimed. Two thousand pounds sacrifice! He's as prodigal as a thief! I'll follow him to the end of the world, if necessary, but at the rate he's going on the stolen money will soon be exhausted.' The detective was not far wrong in making this conjecture. Since leaving London, what with traveling expenses, bribes, the purchase of the elephant, bales and fines, Mr. Fogg had already spent more than five thousand pounds on the way, and the percentage of the sum recovered from the bank robber promised to the detectives was rapidly diminishing. End of chapter 15《Chapter Sixteen of Around the World in Eighty Days》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《Around the World in Eighty Days》by Jules Verne, translated by George Makepeace Towell.《Chapter Sixteen, in which Fix does not seem to understand in the least what is said to him. The Rangoon, one of the Peninsular and Oriental Company's boats plying in the Chinese and Japanese seas was a screw steamer, built of iron, weighing about 1,770 tons, and with engines of 400 horsepower. She was as fast, but not as well fitted up, as the Mongolia, and Aouda was not as comfortably provided for on board of her as Phileas Fogg could have wished. However, the trip from Calcutta to Hong Kong only comprised some 3,500 miles, occupying from 10 to 12 days, and the young woman was not difficult to please. During the first days of the journey, Aouda became better acquainted with her protector, and constantly gave evidence of her deep gratitude for what he had done. The phlegmatic gentleman listened to her, apparently at least with coldness, neither his voice nor his manner betraying the slightest emotion, but he seemed to be always on the watch that nothing should be wanting to Aouda's comfort. He visited her regularly each day at certain hours, not so much to talk himself as to sit and hear her talk. He treated her with the strictest politeness, but with the precision of an automaton, the movements of which had been arranged for this purpose. Aouda did not quite know what to make of him, though Passepartout had given her some hints of his master's eccentricity, and made her smile by telling her of the wager which was sending him around the world. After all, she owed Phileas Fogg her life, and she always regarded him through the exalting medium of her gratitude. Aouda confirmed the Parsee guide's narrative of her touching history. She did indeed belong to the highest of the native races of India. Many of the Parsee merchants have made great fortunes there by dealing in cotton, and one of them, Sir Jametsi Gigiboy, was made a baronet by the English government. Aouda was a relative of this great man, and it was his cousin, Gigi, whom she hoped to join at Hong Kong. Whether she would find a protector in him she could not tell, but Mr. Fogg essayed to calm her anxieties and to assure her that everything would be mathematically, he used the very word, arranged. Aouda fastened her great eyes, clear as the sacred lakes of the Himalaya, upon him, but the intractable fog, as reserved as ever, did not seem at all inclined to throw himself into this lake. The first few days of the voyage passed prosperously, amid favorable weather and propitious winds, and they soon came in sight of the great Andaman, the principal of the islands in the Bay of Bengal, with its picturesque saddle-peak, 
two thousand four hundred feet high, looming above the waters. The steamer passed along near the shores, but the savage Papuans, who are in the lowest scale of humanity, but are not, as has been asserted, cannibals, did not make their appearance. The panorama of the islands as they steamed by them was superb. Vast forests of palms, oryx, bamboo, teakwood, of the gigantic mimosa, and the tree-like ferns covered the foreground, while behind the graceful outlines of the mountains were traced against the sky, and along the coast swarmed by thousands the precious swallows whose nests furnish a luxurious dish to the tables of the celestial empire. The varied landscape afforded by the Andaman Islands was soon passed, however, and the Rangoon rapidly approached the Straits of Malacca, which gave access to the China Seas. What was Detective Fick, so unluckily drawn on from country to country, doing all this while? He had managed to embark on the Rangoon at Calcutta, without being seen by Passepartout, after leaving orders that, if the warrant should arrive, it should be forwarded to him at Hong Kong and he hoped to conceal his presence to the end of the voyage. It would have been difficult to explain why he was on board without awakening Passepartout's suspicions, who thought him still at Bombay. But necessity impelled him, nevertheless, to renew his acquaintance with the worthy servant, as will be seen. All the detective's hopes and wishes were now centered on Hong Kong, for the steamer's stay at Singapore would be too brief to enable him to take any steps there. The arrest must be made at Hong Kong, or the robber would probably escape him forever. Hong Kong was the last English ground on which he would set foot. Beyond, China, Japan, America offered the fog an almost certain refuge. If the warrant should at last make its appearance at Hong Kong, Fix could arrest him and give him into the hands of the local police, and there would be no further trouble. But beyond Hong Kong, a simple warrant would be of no avail. An extradition warrant would be necessary, and that would result in delays and obstacles of which the rascal would take advantage to elude justice. Fix thought over these probabilities during the long hours which he spent in his cabin, and kept repeating to himself, Now either the warrant will be at Hong Kong, in which case I shall arrest my man, or it will not be there, and this time it is absolutely necessary that I should delay his departure. I have failed at Bombay, and I have failed at Calcutta. If I fail at Hong Kong, my reputation is lost. Cost what it may, I must succeed. But how shall I prevent his departure if that should turn out to be my last resource? Fix made up his mind that if worst came to worst, he would make a confidant of Passepartout and tell him what kind of a fellow his master really was. That Passepartout was not Fogg's accomplice, he was very certain. The servant, enlightened by his disclosure, and afraid of being himself implicated in the crime, would doubtless become an ally of the detective. But this method was a dangerous one, only to be employed when everything else had failed. A word from Passepartout to his master would ruin all. The detective was therefore in a sore strait. But suddenly a new idea struck him. The presence of Aouda on the Rangoon, in company with Phileas Fogg, gave him new material for reflection. Who was this woman? What combination of events had made her Fogg's traveling companion? They had evidently met somewhere between Bombay and Calcutta, but where? Had they met accidentally, or had Fogg gone into the interior purposely in quest of this charming damsel? Fix was fairly puzzled. He asked himself whether there had not been a wicked elopement, and this idea so impressed itself upon his mind that he determined to make use of the supposed intrigue. Whether the young woman were married or not, he would be able to create such difficulties for Mr. Fogg at Hong Kong that he could not escape by paying any amount of money. But could he even wait till they reached Hong Kong? Fogg had an abominable way of jumping from one boat to another, and before anything could be effected might get full under way again for Yokohama. Fix decided that he must warn the English authorities and signal the Rangoon before her arrival. This was easy to do since the steamer stopped at Singapore, whence there is a telegraphic wire to Hong Kong. He finally resolved, moreover, before acting more positively, to question Passepartout. 
it would not be difficult to make him talk, and as there was no time to lose, Fix prepared to make himself known. It was now the 30th of October, and on the following day the Rangoon was due at Singapore. Fix emerged from his cabin and went on deck. Passepartout was promenading up and down in the forward part of the steamer. The detective rushed forward with every appearance of extreme surprise, and exclaimed, "'You are here on the Rangoon!' "'What, Monsieur Fix, are you on board?' returned the really astonished Passepartout, recognizing his crony of the Mongolia. "'Why, I left you at Bombay, and here you are, on the way to Hong Kong. Are you going round the world, too?' "'No, no,' replied Fix. "'I shall stop at Hong Kong, at least for some days.' "'Hm,' said Passepartout, who seemed for an instant perplexed. "'But how is it I have not seen you on board since we left Calcutta? "'Oh, a trifle of seasickness. I've been staying in my berth. "'The Gulf of Bengal does not agree with me as well as the Indian Ocean. "'And how is Mr. Fogg?' "'As well and as punctual as ever. Not a day behind time.' "'But, Monsieur Fix, you don't know that we have a young lady with us.' "'A young lady?' replied the detective, not seeming to comprehend what was said. Passepartout thereupon recounted Aouda's history, the affair at the Bombay Pagoda, the purchase of the elephant for two thousand pounds, the rescue, the arrest, and sentence of the Calcutta court, and the restoration of Mr. Fogg and himself to liberty on bail. Fix, who was familiar with the last events, seemed to be equally ignorant of all that Passepartout related, and the latter was charmed to find so interested a listener. "'But does your master propose to carry this young woman to Europe?' "'Not at all. We are simply going to place her under the protection of one of her relatives, a rich merchant at Hong Kong.' "'Nothing to be done there,' said Fix to himself, concealing his disappointment. "'A glass of gin, Mr. Passepartout?' "'Willingly, Monsieur Fix. We must at least have a friendly glass on board the Rangoon.' End of chapter 16